warning off, don't do that. And it, it wouldn't have happened in a European court. So that's pretty standard now for children or some people with a learning difficulty, but it still has to be applied for. And here we are, video recorded interview, section 27. So it's a special measure. This is slightly different to all of the others in that we actually do the interview and then apply for it to be used. All of the others so far, it's at a, it's at a pre trial hearing, we make application for it, ready for the trial. This one is done very early. It's actually conducted during the investigation, so, and that causes problems sometimes for police officers because it's asking a police officer to conduct an interview <coughs> that can be used as the evidence in chief in a courtroom, but at the time they're doing it, they're still conducting an investigation. And that can cause some problems about what, what leads the interview, the investigation, or, or only what this child would ever go to court and say. Is, is that, does that make sense? And then we've got section 28. This is, uh, we used to not talk about section 20, 28. I can remember laughing and saying, oh, oh, that would never come in. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's been trialed uh, in three areas and it's now in. Uh, it's coming in uh, to a city near you in September. It's going to go alive. I think they're starting to have a wobble and saying, well, shall we just pick the top 20? Uh, uh, courts in the country because it's such a massive thing to do. Section 28 is pre-recording the cross-examination. So that will even be done before the trial. And what triggers a Section 28 cross-examination is that there was a Section 27 video interview. So it, it, so it, it cuts down uh, the length of time to get somebody into a courtroom because the trial can't run until that cross-examination is taken place without the defendant present, just the defence barristers. And the one that I'm probably going to talk the most about today, uh, examination of the witness through a intermediary, a registered intermediary. We've never had this before. This, uh, this was quite new when it came, came in. Initially, uh, when the legislation came in, it said, no, sort of panic, we, we haven't got any. We've invented it, but it doesn't exist as a concept. We've now got to start recruiting people. I'm hoping at the end of this presentation, some people are going to be interested in becoming one of those because there is a national shortage of registered interviews. So, what, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that person does, but what that person he helps us with is gathering the evidence. So, gathering that section 27 evidence in chief interview, and will stay with that vulnerable person and assist them all the way through the court. The registered intermediary works for the court, doesn't work for the investigation. But they will assist in helping with communication. So I'll, I'll show you some of the do's and don'ts about what a registered intermediary does. Is there anybody here who is a registered intermediary? And had you training down at City of London? No, we're not registered. Oh, non-registered, yeah, yeah. Not feel smart for being registered. Wait for the train. Yeah. So it's not explained. Is it? Yeah, rang them up. Yeah, rang them up. <laughs> they sound like they're having more fun. Do I need to do something different? Uh, and then eight. Communication. Um, so this can be anything that we use to help with communication. So if you think of a young child who might be needing to talk about some abuse that's happened to them, we, there may be props used, toys, dolls, things like that. The police officer can't use that, uh, they're not trained to do that, but with the use of the registered intermediary and using dolls, we might be able to get a better story, a, a better account of what happened to that child. So that would be classed as a communication aid. It still has to be applied for. So if you think of a video interview, when we go for an application to, to use, uh, I'm, no, I'm going to be louder. We're going to uh, make an application for the video interview.
for the registered intermediary and for any communication aids that we use. So this is a, so this is a big application that goes before the judge pre-trial. So let's show you what a fairly standard video interview looks like. This is Lois, she looks absolutely nothing like this now, she's about 15. Last time I saw her was shot. Here she is at uh, six, came into the police station for me to uh, set up and she used to do some role play for me. So a fairly standard video that will be played in a courtroom. The, the, the idea being that she should be close enough in the camera to look as if she was in the courtroom. The guidance, the Home Office guidance says we have to have what's called a picture in picture to show what else is happening in the room. So that's, that's a fairly standard uh, video. It's timed, it's recorded, it's dated, and all of that carries its integrity. So who's allowed in? Because she's only young. She's, up, she's, uh, she's about six or seven there. So she's a very young girl, and as you can see, she's come and she's put a best dress on, and she's put a best uh, bow on, because she knew she was coming. I was also a painter. <laughs> <laughs> Who can come in with her? Somebody to support her? What do you think? No? As long as they're not linked to the counter, it is. Yeah, and it, would you think mum or dad have an automatic right in there? No. What would be the problem with mum or dad being in that room? They could even relate them just by looking at them. They wouldn't know to speak. If a child is going to, and I'm going to talk, I know it's, it's Friday morning, but it, the, the present, you know, the, the day will get better. After <laughs> it, it, when a child's going to talk about maybe a, a penis being put in her mouth, or around her, what she might call a tuppence or a flower. Can you imagine her trying to explain that or say that when her mum is sat there? That child now has to filter what she's saying to us through the fact that that would upset her mum. So maybe she wouldn't want to talk to us. So we wouldn't want parents in. So, so, so it's not an automatic right. But if we weren't going to get that information, because she wouldn't talk to us without somebody who made them feel safe, would we let them in? Yes. But we'd have to make sure that they understand the rules because they're not allowed to talk on her behalf. Because this is Lois's story. Lois says I'm being abused by me. This is Lois's story, not her supporters, her mom, her brother, her dad, whoever it is. They it has to be heard as if she's saying it. Uh, in a witness box, in a courtroom. So sometimes, yeah, we can have support in the room. But would it be, always be a family member? But can you see it, it quite a, a difficult area to put a family member in? Because a mum, a dad, a brother, doesn't actually have to say anything. Just the way they might tense their body, the way they get up tight can, can affect how she's going to speak. So we would be very reluctant. And the guidance says, uh, don't look to family members. What about a carer? What if Lois has got a learning difficulty and she has a carer? And that carer has really learned how she works, how she communicates, how she functions. And that carer says, do you know what? You'll not get a very good interview without me. Would we let the carer in? It depends what we are investigating. Well, yeah, of course we wouldn't let somebody in over investigating. But would you let a carer in? Because you're saying yes. But what would be the problem with a carer? It might be more emotionally linked. What? Yeah. They might try to speak for. Yeah, because that's what happens. What happens when your child or, or, your, or your child with a learning difficulty gets to a really, really problematic area because it's not nice? What would the carer potentially do? What would you do as a parent? Tell me a child. Help, jump in, say something, help them out. I would be, you know, my daughter's 26 now, but if my daughter's a young girl, I'd have a lot more out of my house than my own mom. I'll tell you what's happened. Um, and that's not, that wouldn't be her evidence in chief. Would we let an interpreter in if 
Floris's language, her first language is in English. Yeah. So we would, an interpreter would be in the room. So all of a sudden, if we're going to let a supporter in and an interpreter, that room's getting already crowded. That's already two people extra in the room, over and above our victim and the person who's interviewing her, the person who's trained to interview, which is either a police officer or a social worker. <coughs> An advocate, somebody who's going to help with communication, would we let that person in? Yeah. So that would be the registered intermediary. Somebody who is not going to help the police with, that's a really bad question. What you want to be asking is this, that's not what they do. But they will give guidance about, that's a complex question. And when I show you the footage, you're going to see a question that is quite complex that the officer asks and the registered intermediary struggles. So, if we've got a registered intermediary in the room, and we need an interpreter in the room, and we need the interviewer in the room, and of course we need Lois in the room, should we be looking to not have? So this is what a registered intermediary would work with that child and build a relationship. This interview wouldn't take place with the registered intermediary just sort of meeting somebody for a few minutes. This is a, 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 a professional process where they uh, learn how this person, how this child communicates, meets their specifications, and may be sufficient with the police officer or the social worker that actually I'm okay without anybody else in the room. Because each of these, those people, that child has to filter and work out what am I saying with these people in the room. So the registered intermediary scheme is about facilitating communication with people who are vulnerable. Came into being in 2004. Uh, eventually got, it was trialled, eventually it was rolled out in 2008 to all of the police forces, which was great, except there weren't many of them. And South Yorkshire uh, police area, we had not. Humberside had two. West Yorkshire had half a dozen. And it wasn't good enough. So the Ministry of Justice had been constantly uh, touting get them to come forward. So what does it say? What are they? Um, it means that they are registered on our national database. So they're not just somebody who's a professional in that particular area. They have to be trained at the City of London University to the standards set down by the Ministry of Justice. And they're held on a database that's managed by the National Crime Agency. Who are they? They are speech and language therapists. They're nurses occupational therapists, health workers, psychologists, other specialists, social workers, teachers, anybody who can help with communication. Anybody. It's, they're not looking for just one type of person because we don't know what tomorrow we need with regards to communication. So we need a, a breadth of people with that specialism who will come forward and um, be trained. And the training is about core process. It's not it's not in their field of expertise. It's about how the registered intermediary scheme works when the case is going to court. What do they do? What do they don't do? What do they don't do? <laughs> what they do not do. Uh, so they enable complete co uh, coherent accurate communication to take place between a witness. They are a special measure, so they will learn how that child communicates and they will assist the investigation to be able to communicate with that child in that way. They've got to have a clear, comprehensive understanding of their responsibilities. They are responsible to the court, so they're not working for the police. It sounds a little bit like an interpreter, doesn't it? Carry out functional assessments of the communication needs. And, and do a report to the professionals about this is what you need to do, this is your strategy in order to be able to communicate with this person. Uh, they'll meet with the witness, support the judge, they'll learn how that person communicates in a normal environment and then bring that as part of an assessment and give some guidance to the police. They sometimes are there in the interview room in order to assist lifetime 
but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they'll do a report and say that's enough. So if you follow this guide, this guidance, you don't need me there. But all of that assessment will be with the interviewer, the person who's actually going to conduct the interview with the child. What they won't do is give advice or express an opinion as to, uh, I don't think she's done it. I don't think Dad did it like that. That's, that's not their job. That's the investigation. Uh, they cannot be involved in the investigation in any capacity. So if we've got a social worker who is uh, working on this case with us, and that social worker is a registered intermediary, that they can't be a registered intermediary on that case. They can't change the content of what's being said, and they must not use any knowledge that they've gained uh, to their own advantage or improperly. Again, it sounds a bit like a using an interpreter, doesn't it? Right on the roll, the Lord Judge, fantastic name, isn't it? What we used to be called Judge Judge. Um, Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales in, at the uh, Australian Institute of uh, uh, Judicial Administration Conference said this, the use of intermediaries had introduced fresh insight into the criminal justice process. There was some opposition. It was said, for example, that intermediaries would interfere with the process of cross-examination. Others suggested that they were expert witnesses or supporters of the witness. They are not. They are independent and neutral. They're properly registered. Their responsibility is to the court. Their use is a step which improved the administration of justice and it has done so without a diminution in the entitlement of the defendant to a fair trial. The opposition, interestingly, was at the court itself. It wasn't from uh, the police side, the investigation side. Uh, the police were very quick to see registered intermediaries as an asset. It was the court, particularly the defence, that didn't, didn't want them. So I'm going to talk uh, to you about a case today. I have been given uh, kind of permission to show you this, uh, this footage. This, as I said, this is not 